Genesis 14, we meet Melchizedek, the mysterious king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. When Abraham, after a victorious battle, tithed to Melchizedek, it symbolized giving to God and receiving his blessings. Fast forward to Hebrews 7 in the New Testament, and we discover that Jesus is our high priest, following the order of Melchizedek. This reaffirms the significance of tithing as an act of trust and allegiance to Jesus. So, whether in the Old or New Testament, tithing is a declaration of faith, acknowledging God as our savior, deliverer, and healer. It's not just an old practice, it's a timeless principle of obedience and blessing. Today I want to start a series simply entitled Legacy. Man, it's so good to see you guys this morning. And I just, I just feel, I still, I want to pray for a minute before we go any further, just, just to kind of put the presence of, of God in this place this morning. Amen? Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what we feel in this place right now. I thank God for your anointing over this house, for every soul, every, every body. Let, 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 your, let your arms of love just engulf this place. Let us be reminded how much you love us. And we trust you, Lord Jesus. We trust you, Lord Jesus. We trust you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody say amen. amen. I just, I just, we're not done. There's, there's still some presence. There's some things going to happen here in a few minutes. Uh, real quick, just kind of, it was fun. Friday night was so fun to, to realize that our building is too small for Friendsgiving. All right, so we had to come in the auditorium. Look at this. Just look at some of these pictures. Look at this. There's another good one. Oh, change, change. Here we go. People everywhere. Come on, isn't that cool? Yeah. I'm excited. I, I, I'm looking forward to what happens next. I, do, I know that I've got, I've got a plan in my mind. I believe God's given me, but it's just exciting to see it coming to pass. And you guys can see all the changes to the facility inside and out. We're almost through. We'll be done by Christmas time, I'm believing, with the last bits of it. And it's all going to be beautiful. It, it is already looking amazing. It's such a joy to pull up here. Isn't, isn't it, doesn't it feel light and wonderful when you pull up in the parking lot? You go, wow, look at this. It's just, this is the presence of God is here. It's just, it's just a beautiful place to be. I'm so thankful for that. I'm also looking forward to the day when I knock it all down. Oh, hallelujah. Don't fall in love with a building. Fall in love with Jesus. A building will accommodate what he wants us to do in it. That's how that works. How that's going to happen one day. I don't know when, but I believe God's going to give us a 2,500-seat auditorium. Who wants to believe that with me right now? I don't believe it. 2,500 seat auditorium. I believe it's going to come. Well, that's kind of big, preacher. So? It's also kind of small. Hallelujah. It's coming. It's coming. I believe it's going to be a day we can't, we can't manage it all. Very soon. We can't manage it all in, in our current condition. And I like our current condition. But, but I can't wait to see what Listen, never be afraid to let go of what God's done with. I know that we get attached to things, and God had it in our life for a season. And when it's time for the season to shift, we, we have a hard time shifting because we're still holding on to what God gave us all those years ago. Amen? Okay, I won't, that's another sermon. We'll get out of that for right now. Get ready for it. Get ready. I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm not looking to do it tomorrow. I'm just telling you, get ready for great transition, not only in this church, but also in your lives. This world's getting crazier, but God is always above all this mess. Be ready for the great transitions that are coming. Because God's got big plans for your family, for your house. Be ready for that. I'd rather you be thinking big than thinking small. Our God's a big God. Amen? Amen. And yet, it tests our faith sometimes to think big, big, big. But you got to do it. Scan this real quick. Get the notes. Get the notes for today's sermon. I think it's so funny that we've had 70,000 downloads of these notes since January. Isn't that wild? I think that's amazing. I don't know where they're all at, but I can't wait till I see them all. It would be great when we see them all in person. But God does some amazing things. We're gonna, I'm going to finish up real quick with uh, the, the final message of our, our giving series called Legacy. And we don't teach this but once a year, one season a year. 
four sermons and because this church thrives on, on your faithfulness of tithing all year long. But this happens to be the last Sunday. Now next Sunday, I'm going to be speaking about next year. Talking about what God's bringing us to. This, this year's message was arise. And boy, has this church risen up. We've seen, have you noticed the growth in this house in the last just eight months in this house? And that's just one service most of you are seeing. We're seeing it all over the place. And we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. And so... I'm going to hopefully be presenting to you prayerfully what I believe God wants to see next year. So we go into the rest of, ne of next month really, really focusing on the plan that we believe God's releasing in this house. And so be ready for that next Sunday. No matter what you're going to do, be here. I know you're going to be full like me. You're going to have a hard time getting out of bed Friday morning. You're going to roll over twice, maybe four times. But you got a full two days to recover. And I get back in the house and something big's going to happen. I really believe it all in my heart. Something big's going to happen. So be ready. All right. Let's start Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. We've learned a few things in the last three weeks. And the whole sermon series is in the church app. So download the church app. Get that. And you can see the whole sermon series on the legacy. Click on it. You can see the whole thing. Also, you see all the upcoming events. I mean, we got a, the December 22nd is going to be awesome. Band General will be here, both services. I can't wait for that service. It's going to be a powerful time. We've heard it earlier this year. You're going to love it. We learned that a high priest represents your interest in gifts and sacrifices for sins. He receives offering from worshiper, and, if he, and he offers it up to God. If the worshiper brings nothing, then nothing he can offer. We talked about this process of who he is as the high priest. There is not a sacrifice for sins, but we still bring gifts. Gifts is an attitude of thankfulness. Gifts is an attitude of praise. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was the great sacrifice. And we also learned that tithing was before the law under Melchizedek, the high priest Melchizedek. I know some people say, well, tithing, uh, is, uh, we're no longer living under the law. We're under, under the atmosphere of grace, dispensation of grace, so we don't do that. Tithing began before the law began. Isn't that beautiful? Under Melchizedek. And the high priest shows up, Abram goes to war, defeats four armies, comes out. Here, here shows up the Melchizedek who has no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. Sounds familiar, doesn't he? Yeah. And Abram gives tithe to Melchizedek of all, recognizing his high priest. There was a high priest long before the Levitical priesthood. Jesus Christ is the high priest under, after the order of Melchizedek. That's who he is. He is our high priest. Hebrews 7 and 8 says it like this. Here, men that die receive tithes, but there he, who's that? The high priest, receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. It's a powerful thing whenever you realize that when you give here in this world, in the spiritual realm, he also receives it, and it's a witness that he lives. But there, understand, here we give it, but there. Somebody say, but there. It's a, it's a great butt right here. This is a good butt. Normally you get, you know, somebody says something, they go, but. No, this is a good butt. Whenever we give here, he also receives it there, but there he receives it and presents it as a gift. There's a record kept. Listen, if God counts every hair on your head and has every hair numbered and every tear caught, don't you also know when he, he will know when you give? Hallelujah. He also has record of that as well. So when we give, it has impact on our life because he is there. Number five, communion, the bread and the wine, which is what Melchizedek brought when he met Abraham, is to proclaim his death till he comes. Tithing is to proclaim the Lord lives. We don't give to something that's dead. We tithe because our Lord is alive and well, and we celebrate that every time we give in tithe. It's a worship that we give to him. Whenever the, Jacob saw the wagons coming from Egypt. I told you the story. Joseph, who is now second in command, there's a drought, famine. He sends the boys out there. Here comes Joseph, second in command. He could have had all his brothers who sent, sold him into slavery, arrested. Instead, he blessed them and sent the tithe from Egypt to, to Jacob, which is Israel. Jacob refused to believe his own son was alive. He believed the story his sons originally told him. He's dead. A lion killed him. But when he saw the ten wagons being pulled by the ten female donkeys, and the ten male donkeys, he saw the tithe of Egypt coming to his house. And Jacob 
So the Bible says Israel became alive. Jacob is Israel. His name was changed. But when Jacob's in his flesh, he's Jacob. When Jacob's in his anointing, he's Israel. Jacob, Israel become weak and begin to operate in flesh, and Jacob is living in doubt. But when he saw the tithe of Egypt coming to his house, he recognized, my son is alive, and Israel stood up and began to celebrate. Tithing will make an unbelieving believer a believer again. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. When somebody begins to tithe, they begin to trust in God more and more, and it changes everything in their life. Absolutely beautiful when you recognize who you're giving to. We also learn that the tenth, the tithe, the tenth, is a feminine tense. Why is it feminine and tense? Because we are the bride of Christ. And when you tithe, we present the womb for the seed speaker to speak into. God is the seed speaker. That's what he does. He speaks seed. In the beginning, there was nothing until he spoke. When he spoke, let there be light, light. Then he said, let there be, and everything he spoke came to pass as he spoke it. Whenever you tithe, whenever you present God a womb to speak into, he can speak health into you, deliverance into you, blessing into you. It's all a part of relationship with him. Isn't that wonderful to know? He's a seed speaker. How many want God to speak into your life? I want God to bless, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. The Lord says, have you looked at the account recently? You haven't presented a womb. You want me to speak into something? Where's the womb to speak into? Here's my faith, Lord. I'm trusting you. Tithing is a beautiful thing, not an aggravated thing, not a burdensome thing. It's a beautiful thing. Celebrating that Jesus lives, and when we tithe, we present the womb. He's a seed speaker. We tithe, we present the womb for him, and he speaks into it. It's all about relationship and faith. We also learn that God always has his portion. He always does. His portion, what you do not touch. We had it in the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't touch it. We don't touch it. We did touch it. Sin comes in the world. The earth becomes cursed. What is God's is God's. And we leave it alone. He said, that 10% belongs to me. So therefore, it's his. We don't touch it. We also learn that the earth is living under a curse from the fall of Adam. The earth is already cursed. When Adam fell into sin, the earth became cursed. Adam had to work for his food. They had kicked out of the garden. The earth has been living under curse. That's why you have storms and chaos and earthquakes. All these things happen because the earth is living under a curse. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 9, the scripture says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And they said, How have we robbed you? Because in tithes and offerings. The Bible doesn't say that God wants to curse you if you don't tithe. He's trying to tell you the, cur the world's already under a curse. And if you're not tithing, your finances are under the curse of the world. Everything in your life comes from the earth. Your iPhone came from the earth. Your Bitcoin still come from the earth. That computer can't run without the earth minerals to make it. It all comes from the earth. Whenever we tithe, we break off, we, that breaks the curse off the remaining 90% of our finances. We know the curse will be broken in Revelation 22, but right now we're still living under curse. Our souls have been redeemed from the curse of this earth so we can be saved. But the worldly things of this life, our finances are still tied to the curse until we tithe. And when we tithe, we break the curse off of 90%. It'll be, you'll be amazed at what 90% will do in your life. It'll change everything. God's always provided. God's always given. He's always supplied. Even when I thought, Lord, how's it going to happen? And, and we stay faithful, and he still does the work. It's incredible what God will do when you trust him with one of the most basic things, finances. I know sometimes when I preach this, the enemy tries to whisper, they're thinking about so-and-so preacher who did it wrong over there, and so-and-so pastor who did it wrong over there. Let me tell you something, do not tie man to your ties. Men are not perfect, and neither are you. Hallelujah. Look in the mirror tomorrow and go, I'm not perfect. And it may be hard for some of us to say, but we're not perfect. My wife tells me to say, Michael, you're not perfect. I, I know, baby, but I'm, I'm close, though. I'm close. <laughs> when I face the mirror this way, I look perfect. Turn this way, not so perfect. But if I just keep facing this way, <laughs> it's perfect. Right? We're striving towards it. Don't lose out with blessings with God just because a person failed you. Or made mistakes. 
for as many bad pastors there have been in the world, there's also been bad saints. Why? Because we're human beings. That's the process. All right. So today, I want, that's what we've covered. I want to go into the four fundamental types of giving that you find in Scripture. There's actually more. These are the four basic types you see listed in Scripture. I want you to understand what they mean and what they do. The first is an alms. What do you read about alms? Alms, read about it in Luke 14 real quick. Let's go there. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Also Matthew 6 and 4, thine, that thine alms may be done in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Alms are a powerful thing. It's mentioned 13 times in Scripture. What's the motivation for giving an alm? Sympathy. Where is it given? Wherever there is a need. Uh, this church has, we just collected, was it 30, for 30 families? We, we, we got turkeys for 30 families from Sickle Cell. Or, isn't that wonderful? You guys did an awesome job for that. Thank you so much. 30 families being affected. I just passed by the toy room. I won't tell you where it is because, you know, we're taking them somewhere. There's a room full of toys in this church. We're going to show you some pictures next week so you can see what you guys have been bringing. It's, it's amazing what's been happening. But there's a need, so we see a need and we, and we go to it. An alm is a powerful thing when you see a need. That's also what you see in Scripture when you would see the blind or, the, or those who are hurt or lame by the gate going, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. It's because they were asking, it was a sympathy thing, would you please bless me? What happens to an alm? Where is it given? Wherever is the need. The return, the rate of exchange for an alm is, he said, oh, what? I'll recompense, I will reimburse you. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. If you bless somebody in need, God says, I'll give it back to you. And if you do it in the secret place, I'll make sure you're rewarded for it openly. We don't walk around bragging about who all we gave it to. If you, I, I changed some lives yesterday. I changed some lives. No, that's not the way you do it. You just do the job and let God bless you openly. That's what he does. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. My, my, many years ago, my wife took away all my cash. I don't have any cash anymore. I don't carry cash on me because if I have cash, I give it to people. Even when I don't have it to give, I'll give it away. It's just, it's just in my pocket. So therefore, it goes someplace. So when we live in Austin and, and, and uh, I would come to every stoplight, I have some cash in me. I had a limited amount of cash. That was cash to do lunch or whatever it was. And I'd pull up and there'd be some dude on the side of the road with a street sign. Holding a little sign up, you know, need help. And I'm like, oh, here, dude, you know, take this. My wife said, we got to eat too. <laughs> you keep giving away the money so she could away my cash. And so I've noticed that around this area, we're, that, that was back in Austin, Texas. We're starting to look like that here now. Every corner there's somebody with a sign. Now, let me just go ahead and give you a warning. I have seen literal shift changes at those intersections. Have you seen that? You know, we're at a certain red light count, whatever it is, they all change corners at the same time together. Listen, that, there's something else is going on there. That's a business situation happening. You got to... Not everybody out there asking for it is actually in need of it. They, they're making a pretty good living. Somehow they wouldn't be out there. Something's going on. It's different. So, you know, my wife's like, I'm glad you don't have any cash anymore. I'm like, well, okay, then that's probably a good idea because I'm giving to a fresh entrepreneur right there on the side of the street <laughs> who's got shift changes, lunch breaks. <laughs> I think they all meet up somewhere and have a party when it's over every day. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just saying it looks awful strange these days. They don't look normal. I better get off that. Let me move on. Um, that's, and God said, I'll reward you for it. So an alm is an alm. I've heard people say, well, I like to tithe. I give my tithe to people that I, that I see that need help. You just turned your tithe into an alm. There's a different rate of exchange for tithing. An alm is a whole different bargain. It's a much lower rate of exchange. Well, I just feel good about blessing people. Well, that, that's wonderful. Do that, but don't call it your tithe. All right. The next one, seed offering. Everybody say seed offering. seed offering. Seed offering happens 284 times in Scripture. Here's a couple of verses of Scripture to back that up. Uh, Matthew 13 and verse 23. But he that receiveth seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bears fruit and bringeth forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. A seed offering is mentioned 284 times in Scripture. The motivation behind a seed offering is the hearing of the Word of God and planting in good ground. When you hear the Word of God, you're motivated to plant seed into good ground. Where is it given? Wherever the Word is preached. 
where the word is preached, that's where you sow seed. The return on a seed offering can be 30, 60, or even sometimes a hundredfold return. I like to tell this story. The, the best stories are the true ones, and I tell true stories. Hallelujah. I try to tell jokes and it don't work. I just, jokes don't work. They gotta be, it's just got to be a story because stories are way more real. I, I'll give you an example. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a dad joke right now. How do you know when a joke is becoming a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. How do you know when the dad joke is a parent? Upon delivery. Okay, moving on. Um, doesn't work. So I tell the real stories. Those are much more fun and enjoyable. Where was I at? Okay, hold on. Um, seed offering. It's powerful. Where's it given? Where's the words preached? 30, 60, 100 fold return. A seed offering is a powerful thing. Years ago, my wife and I were pastoring a church in Texas, and we have done this since then in many other ways. But this is one of my favorite stories to tell. It just has a lot of connectability in our life personally. And so we also have a house that we have due to all this. But let me tell you the story. Years ago, we, we had a town of 800 people. It was in the middle of nowhere. It had a caution light when we went there, one caution light. It did grow to a red light before we left, so we were really progressing. And while I was there, we were looking to buy land for the church. We wanted to build a new building. And so my wife and I went to a conference. We had a conference. We were there for two days. And we had 600 bucks, something like that, in cash. We get in the service, and we see an opportunity to sow seed into different ministries, to plant seed. And I heard the Lord say to me, give all. And I looked at my wife, and I said, did you hear that? And she said, something about give all. And I went, oh, I was hoping you wouldn't have heard that. I was hoping that you would have said, I didn't hear that. <laughs> and so we gave all that we had, all the cash that we had, we gave it in that service to different ministries. We planted seed in the different missions. It was a powerful moment. When we come home, we have to live on credit cards because we have no more money left. We're done with the cash. So every day that week, somebody called us to take us to lunch. I, I was out, by Wednesday, I'm like, you calling me for lunch? Okay, great. Let's go eat lunch. <laughs> I was ready. Every day, we was eating somewhere. I knew he was eating someplace, and it was good. And then by Friday, a man called me, and he said, I want to take you to lunch. And I said, yep, wait for that steakhouse. Steak sounds great. Let's do steak. Well, you're buying, right? Okay, good. Let's go. And we go to the steakhouse, and we're sitting there. And he says, God told me to give this to the church. And he slides a check across the table for $10,000. Now, when we gave that 600 bucks, we said for an immediate financial blessing for Church of the Hills. That was the church he was pastoring. Immediate financial blessing for the church. Within one week, God took my 600 and made $10,000. We needed money to put down to buy the 100 acres of land. I took that $10,000 check and, and the story that God just had us go through to the pulpit the next morning. And the church was about as big as the center section right here from the soundboard to the platform. Just the center section. There's probably 35 people sitting in that building. I start preaching about faith, about sowing seed. And I tell the story of my wife and I sowing $600 at this conference. And all of a sudden, God took $600 and made it $10,000 by the weekend. And I showed the $10,000 check, and I'm preaching, preaching. Out of that center section of 30 or 40 people, they came walking up, started putting money on the floor. Now, I wasn't used to this. I don't think they were either. And I just kept preaching. I didn't know what was going on. At the end of the service, $40,000 hit the floor. <clears throat> so the next day, we had $50,000 to take to give to the bank to put down on 100 acres of land that only at that time cost $100,000. God, will, when you plant seed into good ground, you will see a return come back to you. God decides the return, but you got to trust him on the seed. And you got to make sure it goes into good ground. This place is good ground. On, on December 1st, 31st to the 31st, we have our legacy offering. This is the opportunity that we give every year for someone to plant a seed, to see something multiply. This is where you get with your family, you pray about it, you say, what are we going to give? What's our legacy offering going to look like? What are we believing God for? Is it for a new job? Is it for this? you got to name your seed. Speak faith to it for immediate financial blessing for the church, what we wrote down. Speak some faith to it. Put, put in the offering and let God do what God does. You're sowing into good ground. It will come to pass and you will see a miracle. So get ready for that. Next month, legacy offering time. Last year, you guys gave $43,000 in legacy offering. Give yourself a hand. That's incredible. The year before, you doubled it from the year before. I'm believing God for a doubling again. Come on, somebody. 
Why not? You see what we do with it. We show you what we do with every dime of that when it comes in. We give it to you so you know what's going on. It affects everything about this church and the ministry this church is doing to all those around us. It changes people's lives. And it also gives you the opportunity to sow seed to see greater return upon investment. Isn't that wonderful to know that the kingdom of God does have a return upon investment? It's beautiful. He'll treat you way better than the stock market ever will. Hallelujah. All right. For a third kind of offering, first fruits offering. First fruits is mentioned three, 990 times in Scripture. Motivation and sacrifice. Not the value of the offering, but the sacrifice of the offering. And the return is God's value to your value is at least a two to one. At least a two to one. That's the value of exchange on a, on a first fruits offering. First fruits, it has a, a lot of Scriptures to it. Let me, let me give a couple of them real quick here. Luke 6.35. Love your enemies. Do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you'll truly be acting as the children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father's compassionate. Do not judge others, you'll not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Whenever you give God an offering, it, he says, I'll bring it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. It's kind of like my plate on Thanksgiving Day. I keep finding room. It's okay if the dressing touches the corn. Just let it, let it become one. It's going to go in the same place anyway. Let it, let it become one. Press it together. Make more room. We're going to have this thing. And then it overflows. How many want to see blessings in your life that look like they're shaken down, pressed down, and overflowing? That's what you need. I, you go to a restaurant sometime, they bring these big bowls out. These big, large, they look like large bowls, and that's a lot of soup. That's a lot of salad. And then you realize that bowl is really, really shallow. And you're like, well, you sorry sucker. I was all thinking of and, you, got, you, just, you gave me a scraping of soup. But with God, he says, I'll press it all down, shake it together. It will overflow in your life if you trust him with the process. All right. Some people preach first fruits like this, and I don't, but I'll give you an example. Some people preach first fruits like the first, your first check on a new job or your first big blessing comes in, you give that whole check as a first fruits. I don't preach that way. I preach that first fruits is connected to tithing. In other words, it's the first thing you give. It's the first fruits. If you want to give first fruits the way I mentioned a minute ago, that's entirely up to you and how you want to do it. But I believe when we tithe, it should be the first thing that we do. That's what Scripture says. I'm going to bring you some. Let's make sure it's the first. I don't wait to the end of the month to go, what's left? Are we going to tithe? Well, we got 3% left. Well, <laughs> we didn't quite make it, did we? It's the first thing. So it's, it's the first fruits of your life. So let's talk about the tithe. The tithe. Tithe is mentioned 38 times in the Old Testament. Tithe is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. If someone tells you tithe is not taught or mentioned in the New Testament, they don't know their Bible. Seven different times. I discussed this with you in, I think, the last two sermons. Where does it get? What's the motivation? Obedience. Just obedience. Being obedient to the Word of God is why we tithe. I don't need any special moments to take place. It's just because the Word said to do it, therefore I do it. Jesus even said to do it, therefore I do it. He says you tithe the mint and the rue and all these things and skip out on justice and compassion. He said all these things should be done without leaving others undone. Even Jesus said you should tithe. So I tithe out of what? Obedience. That's why I do it. Where is it given? The storehouse, the local church. Back then, it would have been the temple. Now, the, we, the temple is the church, the local church. What local church? The church you get fed from. That's where you tithe, where you receive, where you worship at. That's the place you tithe into. That's how it works. Well, I like to give my tithe to this church, that church, that. Okay, you're messing up. Where do you get fed from? That's where you tithe. That's the process of tithing. Um, what's the return? Rebuke the devourer, breaks the curse off your land and money, and pours out blessings you cannot contain. Pours out blessings you cannot contain. Malachi chapter 3. 
You are cursed or cursed, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes in the storehouse, the temple, the church, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me not herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. When you learn what it means to tithe, you are connected to a deeper thing in relationship with Jesus Christ that now you are operating in obedience. How many love it when your kids obey you? How many enjoy disobedient kids? Nobody. Especially at the grocery store. <laughs> Nobody enjoys that one kid. That's going nuts and the mama's ignoring it. No, nobody. I've walked by many a case and thought, I could fix that. <laughs> then somebody's going to call the police. You know how that goes. I don't need to go into all of that. I'm just saying I could, I could solve this problem right here. It don't take a whole lot. But obedience changes everything. Relationship with Christ is about being obedient to the word of God. We cannot live like the world and expect God's blessings. We can't behave like the world and expect blessings. In the first service, I said this, I'll repeat it again. That was, it, it kind of amazes me when you go and you see these award shows for musicians and, and pop singers and stuff, and they get up, and the first thing they say for when they wore for the song that they had was, some of them say, I want to thank God, or I want to thank Jesus Christ, my Savior, for this award. And the song was about twerking. I don't know if, I don't think, I, I just don't see Jesus being involved with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're giving praise to some God, but I don't think, it's not the Lord. The Lord said be moderate in all things. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just saying, we, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to talk different, act different, walk different. Living by faith. We're not supposed to be perfect. We can't be perfect. But we're striving towards it to be like Jesus. Amen. We're going to get there. But it's going to be in his grace that we get there. And because we love others. And because we're obedient to the word of God. Here's how it works. When you learn how to give. And I know this, this is the fourth sermon or third sermon. We just, we just once a year, one season a year. I'm not apologizing for it. I'm trying to let you know. Come next Sunday you'll hear a different thing altogether. But you got to know how to live. Learning how to live in the kingdom of God can be transformative, and it is. But you got to trust him. You'll never hear me get up and say stuff like, if you'll give $99 because Psalm 99 said this, I'll, I'm not that guy. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I don't know that road. I do know that God wants to bless his people, especially those that are being obedient. Well, I've been giving tithes for a long time, and I don't know if I've seen my blessings yet. Well, what you don't know also is what God's kept you from. Come on, somebody. Man, God has kept me from some mess. I had no clue about it till years later. I'm like, whoo, that was impressive. God, thank you for delivering me from that. I didn't know. When you're obedient in the word of God, you'll find yourself blessed no matter what happens. So here's how it works. And it shall come to pass... If thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commands, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee upon high above nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. I love that word, overtake you. No matter where you are, his blessings will overtake your position. He says this. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed thou shalt be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall, thou, shall be thy basket in thy store. Blessed shall thou be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause thy enemies to rise up against thee, and be smitten before thy face. They shall come against you one way, but they shall leave in before thee seven ways. In other words, they'll come at you in a unified front, but when God gets through smacking them around, they scatter like crazy everywhere else they got to go. 
I don't care how big the enemy looks, how ugly it looks, when you are walking faithfully after the kingdom of God, he will take whatever enemy there is. It may look like a mighty wave and say, now I'm going to make you run like dogs, scared to death into the wilderness in seven different directions. I've watched it happen multiple times in my ministry and in my life where people come against the ministry over whatever dumb reason they had, and it looks all big and bad, but at some point God says, now get out of here. I'm telling you, God does powerful things with it. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that you set your hand to. He shall bless in the land which the Lord thy God has given you. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. He shall bless you. How many want to see your storehouse, your bank account blessed? Oh, come on, somebody. Say, yeah. Don't say if you don't mean it. Yes. I want it blessed. That's my storehouse. That's where it's all sitting. In the bank. I want to see multiplication come. I live my life according to these rules. Right now, because of our sickness and stuff we dealt with, there was so much medical debt and mess that came with that. And, and, and normally, that's the reason to panic. But I served a big God. Why am I going to panic about something he brought me through? If he can bring me through it, he's going to take care of the mess that I have to deal with afterwards. If God's big enough to bring you through your issue, he's also big enough to handle the stuff on the other end of it. If God can bring you out of addiction, he'll bring you out of addiction and deal with the mess on the other end. God's so big. Thank God for what he does in your life. Thank you for what he does. Celebrate what he does. Get faithful in the kingdom of God and you will see mighty change in your life. It is transformative. Let's stand together right now. Well, that was my first sermon to stand the whole time. Whoa. First Sunday to stand the whole time. That was fun. Yeah. Getting there. <laughs> I'm trying not to recover too quickly because my wife has a bunch of chores she wants me to do. So I'm trying to keep it real slow. I might need another month, baby, just a little bit longer. <laughs> she got me putting up Christmas decorations already. Oh, I don't know, I don't know, baby, I don't know. I don't know. They sit back down. <laughs> it's amazing how people can be about money. It's one of the only natural earthly things that we have that we can actually use in worship. In a relationship with Jesus. Everything else is spiritual. It's faith, it's belief, it's worship, it's praise. But a tangible thing is financial. And because it's so tangible, sometimes we have a hard time letting that go. And, and not, it's not that God needs your money. He doesn't. I, I, I'm not standing here preaching today because we need your money. God's blessed his house. It's been amazing. You can see all the things changing around here, right? God's blessed his house. I'm not up here preaching to you because oh, we're going to have some money by next week. We're going to have some money. Gonna be. No. I preach this so your life can be changed. So you can walk in blessing and favor. So you can see the bigger things take place in your house. Because it all is tied together. Next Sunday, we'll be talking about the future for next year and what God's, what I believe we're going to see. We're already seeing it now. We're going to see more of it come next year. But I want each of us to know that you are so vital in the kingdom of God, and I want you to walk in favor. I want you to experience it. See it for yourself. Live it. Breathe it. It is transformative. I'm fixing to pray. And when I pray, at the end of that prayer, the prayer team will come down. And if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to have a new beginning with him, if you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you would like to have healing in your body, uh, healing in your marriage, deliverance, whatever the re prayer request may be. It may be you just, want, you just want to have greater faith to step out and try this whole tithing thing. Whatever it is, this prayer team will be here to pray for you. We're going to baptize a few people as well in just a few minutes. So don't run off and leave just yet. Stick around. Let's celebrate as they come out of the water. Let them hear this incredible group of people celebrating what God's doing in their life. But when we pray, whatever you need, 
Come to the altar as fast as you can and do not wait. Perhaps you want to see fulfillment of a word that God gave you. You haven't seen it yet. Come now as fast as you can. Whatever it may be, step out on faith. We are walking into what I believe is going to be the greatest revival the church has ever had. We are seeing glimpses of it right now. But there's coming a day where the flood will be so great. And I'm believing God for every soul that you know that was either hurt, wounded, broken, whatever the list may be, down the row of issues, or never step foot in, is going to find himself in the grace of God, loving Jesus, and saved by his mercy and power. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, for the soul in this room. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our healer, our savior, our deliverer. I thank you, God, that you are so mighty and so big, all it takes is a word from you and everything changes. The enemy scatters like wolves and runs through the woods. I thank you, Lord, that you are so mighty that cancer flees at the sound of your name. Demons tremble at the sound of your name. I thank you, God, that what you are releasing in this house right now is like a wave of your presence that washes over every one of us, speaking into us grace, mercy, purpose, and calling. Lord, I ask for healing to hit this house, salvation to flood this place, that every soul become ignited on fire for your glory and hungry for a move of God. I give you the praise and glory for it right now. In the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray it to be done. And the church says, amen. You need prayer? Come right now. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Come on down. We want to pray with you. We'll be some baptized.